you're dealing in a very kind of tired genre, gangsters. We've seen it a million times, and believe me, it's been done beautifully many times. So to try to find another way into this, um, and going along with the intention of the material, I came up with this kind of larger-than-life world to make it into a kind of John Ford-type drama, good against evil. And the sequence out on the bridge just sort of moved it right into John Ford territory. I felt it was very important to get out of Chicago for a little bit and inhale a lot of fresh air. The whole Montana thing, as scripted, we were supposed to be hiding behind a rock and we're watching for these guys to come over the bridge and then we run across to the bridge. That's the way it was scripted. We got to Montana, we had a blocking rehearsal the day before we were supposed to start shooting. The four of us and Brian went out, we got down behind, we staged the scene behind the rock, we tried to run across this field, it was ridiculous, it was crazy. So we said, look, there's this cabin that we've built for this interrogation scene later, and we've got these horses for another scene when we first arrive. Why don't we all sit in this cabin, play that waiting stuff in the cabin, and then ride up to the bridge on horses? So that immediately, of course, made a simple scene into an extremely complex scene, which took us days and days longer to shoot. But I think it really completely makes the middle of the movie. And this business of coming out and riding on the horses, and I said to Brian, I just want to be loving every minute. I just want to be whooping it up on the way across. You know, here's Oscar Wallace riding this thing. I just said, I just want to let it rip. He said, go ahead, I can, I can always cut around it if I don't like it, you know. He was very good at sort of letting us, letting us bring to our characters what we wanted to bring. I just think a scene like that adds a dimension to a film. It, it does the thing that's great about films, which is it takes you somewhere else. Suddenly we're, we're taken out of Chicago, and we're really not taken out of the movie, but subconsciously now we're, we're just somewhere else, and there's a different flavor. We were actually, I think, hoping for snow. We didn't know how lucky we were, because what we did get were the changing leaves, which was absolutely beautiful. But what happens is just there's another texture. I mean, the story propels itself, and the story is... is uh, is good in its line. It doesn't, you know, we, you realize that you're dealing with prohibition, but suddenly we're reenacting a Canadian border raid, which is, which is really, really great. You know, it gives people maybe a chance to breathe because sometimes even when you watch a city picture, you just can't breathe a little bit. And this picture, you know, certainly allows for that, you know, running horses, which nobody would have ever guessed, but yet it's a real tool. It was a real tool to combat things. That was another thing I said. I said, I just want to be screaming at these guys as I'm shooting. I just want to be yelling. I wanted to just I wanted this business just to be this, this unbelievable adrenaline rush for this accountant blasting away at people with a shotgun. <laughs> at the end of that sequence, Brian said, okay, here's what I want you to do. It's going to be a couple of bullet holes in there, and there's going to be whiskey coming out of this thing. I want you to look around, sneak, and take a drink of the whiskey. I said, oh, no. I said, oh, that's a little bit too much, don't you think? I mean... It's a little, that's a bit much. I don't, I don't really know if that's right. It seems too silly. He said, no, 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 it'll be a great moment. And I really, really hesitated. I really didn't want to do it. I thought, that's just too shticky, you know? But Brian said, no, no, I want them to be laughing all the way up until you die. And I said, he's the director, you know? Uh, absolutely, I'll do it. And of course, when you see the movie, he's absolutely right. It's absolutely the right thing to do at that moment. It's a great moment, and it's all Brian. Ah. Yeah, that whole sequence of scenes leading up to my death, Brian wanted to just use the steady cam, this handheld camera, to do one long flowing scene, almost like you would a stage play, and just keep it playing, keep it playing, and keep it flowing. That which is really hard to do. And it seems to me on that day we had something like an eight o'clock call, and we got in there and started blocking. And I think we shot take one at five o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, my heavens, we just were there all day, you know, preparing to do this. When you use a continuous shot, sort of like a time bomb, you know it's ticking, you know something terrible is going to happen. You establish that Nitty is in the elevator, and you know it's just a matter of time before something terrible is going to happen. <gasps> Brian did not want to actually see Wallace get shot. He thought that would be too much for the audience to handle, and I agreed with it. But he wanted to do this thing hanging me up in the elevator on this hook. And as we were setting this up, and they started coming in and smearing me up with blood, 
you know, Brian, of course, has a reputation, and he certainly did then, of not going easy on the blood. Uh, so they were really laying it on. He came and said, that's too much. He said, that's too much, too much blood. I'm thinking, this is Brian De Palma? He said, no, 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 it was just, you know, he, he was very specific about that. He didn't want it to be too, too gory, but it had to have that kind of impact. And I stood on a box in there, and because I couldn't actually be hung up, you know, but I sort of did my hanging up thing. And we shot the scene where Sean comes in. And as Sean came in and saw me, and looks at me and says, oh, Jesus, you know, and then he lifts me off and lifts me on the ground, I almost wept. Brian always has two sequences as he always does in a picture. He does a creeper sequence, and he does what I call the holdout sequence. Now, the creeper sequence is best identified in this picture as Sean Connery being killed. And what happens is that it's, it's usually a camera that's point of view, that's following somebody that is, is trying to avoid being seen. So it's all done in a very kind of first person kind of subjective kind of way. But the idea of it is that you're setting up tension. Get out of here, you daggle bastard. Go on, get your ass out of here. I was amazed to find out when we were putting all these hits on him, uh, you know, these blood things that explode because he gets, you know, raked up and down with a machine gun, that he'd never had a hit put on him. So when we shot the scene, Sean was like appalled at what was going on. I mean, you know, he played it out, and then he was, you know, some dust got in his eye, and we ran him off to the hospital, and I had to beg him to come back and do that scene again, to take those hits again. He hated it. He, you know, it's just everything he dislikes about movie making. He did not like it, and uh, he had never experienced it before, and uh, thank God I got him to do it again. We finally got another take out of him taking those bullet hits. Of course, he did it beautifully, but uh, he was not a happy guy. Oh, I've made it extremely violent. I mean, this is your lead character, you know, going down, and it's going to motivate Ness to do things he could never imagine that he could do. So it had to be shocking. The other sequence is the holdout sequence. And what Ryan does is that he tells the audience that there's a certain task that the character has to do. And you know what that is. And you're going to expect that to go forward. But what happens is that there are impediments put in the way. David Mamet had written in a period train sequence of cr crashing period trains that as much over budget as we were, this took it to a level that was beyond anything that Paramount was prepared to do. We couldn't find the period trades, and if we did, we couldn't crash them. I mean, it was just, at the time, an impossible situation. I said, well, this scene's basically about Elliot Ness getting the accountant, and whether he chases him on a train, and from a car to a train, and catches him way outside of Chicago, it makes no difference. Maybe he can nail him in the train station. So I said, find me a set of steps in a train station. And of course, Chicago is one of the great train stations, great period train stations. Unfortunately, because at that time there wasn't enough equipment in Chicago uh, to do that, we had to bring a lot of stuff from California. If we could have done the sequence during the day, it was right over a big skylight, we could have done it with the equipment that we had. But they didn't want a bunch of gunshots at Union Station during the day with train passengers coming. So we had to do it at night. And we shot there, I guess, for like 14, 16 nights, and I literally made the sequence up. Of course, inspired by the Potemkin sequence, remembering the baby carriage from the Odessa steps, uh, and Ness, because his wife has just had a baby, you know, a baby represents a kind of purity, and you get you know, the innocent in the midst of this gun battle. I took this great visual idea from Eisenstein's uh, Potemkin with this baby carriage bouncing down the steps and stuck it right in the middle of my gangster shootout. But I literally made it up as I shot it. I, I, needless to say, I had laid the whole movie out shot by shot, but I was like flying through the sequence. And it worked out extremely well. <laughs>
All those choices were sort of made right from the inception of the sequence. I, I'd done, of course, many slow motion action sequences before. I like the stylized use of sound where you get rid of all the, you know, real sound and use sound very specifically to point the audience's ear to specific things happening in the sequence. The work to come up with the, the sequence, which is quite moving. Billy Drago, I thought, just did a terrific job as Frank Nitti. He, in the white suit and everything. Billy Drago is a wonderful actor and the nicest guy, but there's a, a formidable kind of otherworldly thing about the way he looks. And his kind of intensity, I think, in the part of Nitti means that he's a real important screen presence, even when he's not talking. The scenes when he doesn't really have dialogue, he's almost like an extra in the scene, and it's only later on that he becomes you know, the important figure that he is in the movie. He's like the, you know, the white serpent. You know, he's a bad guy, and uh, he doesn't have a lot of scenes in terms of establishing his character. He's just like Al Capone's evil enforcer. So we put him in a white suit to make sure that he stood out when you see him in the background, because this guy is going to become very important. So your eye is really drawn to this white suit, white hat that he wears. Very stylized, beautiful uh, design of uh, his look by Armani. And of course, it gets worse and worse until, of course, Elliot Ness finally throws him off the roof. And we took quite a lot of shots to get them because blue screens, fallings were, you know, not too sophisticated at that time. And we had to do it many times to get it effective. That stunt of him going off the roof is for the audience to savor the bad guy being killed. <laughs> then, of course, the down shot is part of that repetitive uh, manufacturing pattern. And we didn't have him land in the middle, had him land out to the edge. So your eye scan would have to scan all the way along there because, you know, you want enough time for people to take in the whole scene and have the eye scan point to him in the last situation. And of course, then we had this big scuffle about to happen with Al being pulled back by his bodyguards. And then, of course, this beautiful exchanging of the chain between Ness and Stone symbol that we was established early when the group of them were together and immortalized in a photograph that was taken. I remember a scene that we shot and we aborted. There was an ending for the picture where it bookends the whole movie. And what it does, you start close on Capone, he's being shaved again, he's in a barber's chair. And as we pull up, you see that he has reporters around him, but he's in his jail cell. And we started, and I think that the dialogue was new or there was something that wasn't quite right about it. So we did a couple of takes and Brian said, let's not do this today, and we just quit. And I asked him, I said, do you want me to hold the setup uh, and we can come back Monday and maybe you can think about it on you know, over Sunday? He goes, no, he says, it's not right, it's not gonna work. And that was the end of that. Last shot when the film was the newspaper coming off the truck and the guy coming in from a hotel, picking it up and taking it inside, was just starting to get cold. I remember extremely well, because after that shot, I got in the plane and went to the airport and went home. 